This week, we interview the fine folks from Swamp, the software assurance marketplace. In the stories for this week, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but me, Jack, special guest Tyler, John, Larry, Michael Santarcangelo, not Kevin, and Joff are all here in some shape, form, or fashion, so stay tuned for the hilarity that will ensue. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in lovely Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions are the only things getting wrapped. Bits aren't the only things getting banged. And the cocktails, they are, in fact, flowing steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pwn Pad, the Pwn Phone, and the Pwn Pro. For enterprises, there's Pwn Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And here's your host. He's a man that lives by the first two rules that the Marines learn at boot camp. Rule one, always let her drive. Rule two, don't stick things up your butt. Paul <laughs> Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, <laughs> to Security <laughs> Weekly. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian. This is episode 441. And what is today? November 12th, 2015. I am delighted to be here this evening. We've got a whole cast and crew with us. It's going to be spectacular. We've got a fabulous interview. Um, let me very quick say that you should go to shop.securityweekly.com and use the discount code Black Friday and receive 50% off all items in the store. And there is a very, very limited supply of Security Weekly 10-year anniversary hoodies in the store. So make sure you go to shop.securityweekly.com. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash secweekly. Check out all our videos on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash security weekly TV. Now, I would like to introduce, starting to my right in studio, special guest Tyler Robinson is here. Woo woo. Buenas noches. Yeah, it's very nice to have you here, Tyler. We uh, shared some cigars in Vegas a couple of years ago, and now we're here in the studio sharing cigars. <laughs> it's wonderful. Glad you could join us this evening. Appreciate it. Larry Pache is, of mm. course, here with us tonight in the flesh. I yes. just like saying flesh. I know you do. You like, Especially you like, in you relation like to you, Larry. You like it when my flesh, flesh touches. Very, <laughs> you're very fleshy. <laughs> yours. Should I change seats? No. No, we've spent a lot of <laughs> it's time a together. It's, it's okay. Right, I'm glad you're next to me, Tyler. I need some fresh meat. It's good. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I've been replaced already. I see. How and you've got fabulous hair. Yeah. How do you? How do you get your hair? Do you use uh, what kind of hair product? You know, maybe <laughs> later on in the show, we'll talk about some of Tyler's hair products. It's very, very spectacular, Tyler. Don't set it on fire. It looks very flammable. It might be flammable. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the lines via Skype, the Security Weekly cast and crew, Mr. Jack Daniel is here with us. Audio only for Mr. Jack tonight, broadcasting from That's Georgia. Welcome, Jack. Thank you very much. It is great to be back with you, even though I am remote, uh, but it is great to be back with you. So looking forward to tonight's podcast. Nice. 
Mr. John Strand. Hey, John, it looks like you're actually in a house. No, I'm actually in an office. Ah. Uh, it's a new building we just purchased, and uh, it used to be a flower shop. And it still has that flower shop smell, um, which I've, I'm shocked to find out actually is spray paint, but more on that later. <laughs> oh, so wow. you, need, you need to invite me so I can smoke some cigars, John, then you won't have to worry about the, <laughs> the flower or spray paint fla- uh, scent aroma. Or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Michael Santarcangelo is here with us tonight. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Santa Cangelo. Are you are you there, Mike? I can barely hear you. Yeah, man. You can't hear me? No, it's something wrong with my headphones. What? Yeah. It's very, very quiet. <laughs> can you guys shut off the mic filter? God damn it. <laughs> yes. It's the Santarcangelo filter we've got going on tonight. See, now you can say my name right. It's there had to be something. That's right. There is something to be said for that. Um, Mr. Joff Fire, who is a spinning wheel right now, but Joff is with us, I think. Spinning wheel? Yes, hey, I see us. How, how are you? It's good, it's good to be here again. It's good to be here with such a great crew of people, especially Mr. Michael Santicolangelo. My Carolina <laughs> brother, but you know we got to invite Jack into that mix. Though. Yeah, we do. Georgia, okay, Carolina. You guys are like all... Transplants to the South it. now. Yeah, hey, they're diversifying the gene pool. Yeah, you guys should all wear your, <laughs> wear your, sus- wear your suspenders and drink some Bud Light and blow some stuff up. I, I, I'm kind of Larry. Larry, Larry that's a moonshine the, connection, actually. Oh. So, you know, Larry, Larry, that that's no joke. When I got married, my wife's family were very, very happy to see me. Mister Not Kevin <laughs> is here with us as well. Welcome, Not Kevin. Hey, Paul, how's it going? It's going good. Do you have a different hair? Do you I was going to say, it looks like you got a haircut. Yeah. I lost it. I don't know where it went. It looks <laughs> good, dude. I lost the bed. <laughs> I, I lost most of my hair. Not really sure what happened. Wait, out wait. There. You, you, sure. you lost hair in the security industry? How surprising. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us try and make up for that with some facial hair. It kind of helps balance it out. Not no. making fun Tyler doesn't it. have that problem, but. <laughs> 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 um, let's see. There are no further announcements, so I'd like to introduce our special guest for this evening. Miran Livni received a, uh, was here with us tonight, received a degree in physics and mathematics in 1975 from the Hebrew University, uh, and a master's and PhD degrees in computer science from the Wiseman Institute of Science in 1978 and 1984, respectively. Barton Miller is here with us as well, who's a chief scientist of the Software Assurance Marketplace Research Center. In addition to Swamp, Miller also is a professor of computer sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Myron, Miron, did I say that right? Marone? Marone. Yeah, yeah, Miron. Miron. Miron and Bart, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for inviting us a little bit. Of, uh, quite an act, quite an... Uh Engaging group we've got here today. Yes, engaging is is a word for it. Not <laughs> I could think of lots of other words, but um, Miron and Bart, how, respectively, how did you uh, get your start in uh, computer security and, and in computer science? Uh, the computer science is uh, is a long story. I did my first programming in uh, when I was in high school in '67. So some things have changed since. Uh, have been have been doing uh, quite a bit of distributed computing over the years, mm-hmm. uh, developing software, worrying about quality of software, and among the two of us, I am less of a, a software security person, but more of a user of software security. And my involvement in the swamp is more from the perspective of building and operating a, a community facility and making sure that uh, it does what uh, we promise it will do. Yes, re- requirements are important. I know that much about software. <laughs> well, it's nice to have you on the show tonight. Uh, Bart, what about yourself? Oh, did we just lose Bart? Oh, oh we lost Bart. Oh, uh-oh. So, so I, I, I'll, I'll keep, keep you, I'll, I'll tell you what I know about Bart. Bart uh, joined our department the year after I arrived here in 84. And 
uh, his computer crashed, so it's oh, rebooted. Okay. <laughs> uh, you Imagine said something that. about software requirements. That's why you need the software board. assurance. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is the... Uh, and uh, Bart has been... Uh, he got his PhD at, in, in Berkeley and uh, very early got into security issues uh, uh, through uh, fuzz testing. He He's considered... <coughs> father or the grandfather or whatever you want to call it of uh, fuzz testing Hi all. and uh, since then has been uh, working on various aspects of uh, uh, software security and also some soft operational aspect of uh, cyber security. I'm, I'm back in. Can, can folks okay. hear me? Oh, so hey, you Bart, how are you? Yeah, Miron was just telling us all about you. It was fabulous. Uh, <laughs> so, I, so, I, so back to how did he get that rash again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, Bart, Miron was just telling us um, that you have quite the background in uh, fuzzing, software fuzzing. Can you tell us a little right. about that? Well, so, <clears throat> as uh, I don't know if you guys can see me, because I just, my computer just, uh, a purple screen, which is kind of amusing. Um, it's, uh, so um, it started on a dark and stormy night. Uh, <laughs> uh, and lit quite literally, uh, I was uh, uh, assistant professor here, and it was a fall evening, and there was a Midwest thunderbuster going on. And uh, it was long enough ago that I was dialed up on my non-error correcting modem to my to my fax station in my office. So we're dating ourselves back really horribly here. And uh, I was getting errors on the line. So you're typing along and you're getting noise, and, and anybody with enough gray hairs will remember that. <clears throat> and what was, what was weird was not that I was getting errors on the line, but, but those errors were getting into the middle of commands and crashing programs. Hmm. And, and so I, I, and I, it seemed pretty unreasonable that typical Unix utility programs should be crashing as a result of bad characters. So I assigned it as a <clears throat> project to my graduate operating system class because I give them semester long projects mm -hmm. to try to test this out thoroughly. So I decided to call it fuzz because that just seemed like a nice name for it. Um, and we built tools, the fuzz generators to test programs and we could crash a quarter to a third of all the Unix utilities we tested on a large number of platforms. And then what was more interesting is we went into every program and we debugged every program and we found the cause of every crash. Um, and not surprising, number one was uh, pointers leaving their buffers, uh, which hmm. was back, which, which, and we wrote about this and we even speculated on how this was definitely a security problem. Back, this was back in the 80s. And, and about a year later, uh, our, our good friend Robert Morris Jr. Um, let loose uh, hmm. a worm, which uh, took advantage of exactly that uh, that characteristic, the verse stack smashing. So that's, that's, that's the long history. And we've, we've done a lot of work in fuzz testing since then, but the field's gone way beyond us. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people out there doing work in that in a lot of good areas. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to say, Bart, that you completed that project last week. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, almost, almost. So, um, what, what do you teach students about security in, in, in writing secure code? You know, a lot of people ask us that question, like, they feel like that students aren't given the opportunity to write secure code, they're not taught how to write secure code. So I want to ask you both your opinion on um, how you can better teach students to write more secure code. Well, this is something we're actually, we're actively doing. We, I mean, interestingly enough, we don't yet have a course at the university on this. We're, we're actually introducing the course next year. What we have been doing, one of my colleagues and I have been, have been teaching tutorials on secure coding. And we've been teaching them at companies, at conferences, um, at, at, you know, government meetings and things like that. And what happened was, um, I, I, I've been doing breaking code for many years. And I don't remember Marone what year it was, but we were, um, um, Marone, Marone runs a project called the Condor system, which is this large distributed scheduling system for what we call high throughput computing. And, and this is used everywhere. And if the Higgs boson data analysis was done on Marone's software, so that's a pretty big claim to fame. And so many years ago, I, I, uh, I was saying, you know, I said, let me attack your software. Let me, uh, and we were wanted to do an in-depth code analysis. And at the time, we really didn't have any methodology for it. So we developed this methodology. 
And in the process, we've now gone on you know, uh, to assess lots of systems. We've done work for Google with Chrome. We've done Wireshark. We've done lots of uh, software where we do these, where we use our, what we call our first principles vulnerability assessment methodology, which is in-depth access to source code, access to all the resources assessment. And when we were, while we've been doing this over the years, we've been seeing the same kind of repeated, let's say dumb things that people have been doing. And so we started developing some some notes, and then we started developing slides and started teaching this to people. So we've we've grown our secure coding cr uh, curriculum really organically from stuff we've seen, and we've now expanded it. We can now we now have enough for a full semester's class on the subject, and it covers a really wide variety of stuff. But if you look right now in our curriculum, and you look at the curriculum in most universities in this country, we don't teach that. Even the mm. the typical the typical undergraduate computer security class may have you do a little bit of, of this and a little bit of, uh, you know, you're trying to smash a, a stack and trying to detect that in the code, but we really don't teach that well. And that's... Uh, I, 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 I think, uh, the, unfortunately, the problem is, is, is deeper than that, is uh, we don't teach how to write uh, quality software hmm. and... Uh, a, and because I think throughout the whole uh, software stack and, uh, and hierarchy, we are uh, evaluated on functionality, uh, which is easy to grade and easy to measure because uh, that's what attracts you, uh, customers who are willing to pay for the software. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't know how to evaluate, how to measure, uh, robustness, security, you know, how many of the code written by student anywhere is checking uh, return code on system calls? Uh, because nobody cares as long as uh, the software patches a test that demonstrate the functionality. So, yeah, it's an uh, operational test. Yeah. Yeah, an operational test. I mean, instru instructors are very proud of the fact that you submit your code and it gets automatically graded. Basically, you, uh, your program runs in a standard way when you teach a course, and um, it gets it gets it gets uh, so it runs, it gets uh, and and the tool processes the output and gives you a grade based on what it does. And the fact that no, nobody ever looks at the code when I when I I teach the undergraduate mm -hmm. operating system course, and uh, when I teach it. You know, if somebody does something like put embedded constant in their code or doesn't check all the return values or, uh, or any number of other things like that, um, they actually lose significant points. And the students get graded half on the quality of their code and wow, half on how excellent. well it runs. And, uh, and for most students, this is the first time they've ever been confronted with it. And some of it find it uh, both obnoxious and scary. Yeah, I was going to say, part. so is that like a selling point for your class or just the opposite? <laughs> well, some students are really excited about this. You know, uh, you know, I uh, we do fuzz testing on their code. He said, "Okay, you're going to write a tool that's going to process code, process input. It's got to be able to handle anything and still do something reasonably sensible." Um, and so, some students are very excited about it. And where I really hear about it is the five years after the students are out in the real world and going, "You know, I was working for that startup, and uh, you know, we." We did some demonstration and, and we beat out the guys because our code didn't crash and everybody else's did or something mm. like that. And that's really the the part where it pays off. I mean, some t during the during the semester, the students are looking at me going, like, what the hell are you thinking? Mm -hmm. So, so hey, um, hey, Paul, can I? Yeah, ask go ahead, Jeff. Um, so this this just sort of stuck out to me and, and I'm going to show my age here as well. But 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 when when you discovered that you could write beyond the ends of the bounds of an array in in C. Um, did you did it surprise you? And did you try to contact Cunningham and Ritchie and say, "Hey guys, your compiler sucks. Uh, we can we can completely write way beyond the ends of this array." I, I'm just curious as to what your initial reaction was, and I'm talking late '80s here. Well, um, you know, I you know, obviously, we all knew that that that. Pointers and, and and arrays and uh, and buffers and dynamic memory allocation in C and C plus plus is a challenge. And so what what surprised me was how frequently it occurred. It just I mean it was by far the number one problem in the code. And 
And and yeah, actually, I did I had a chance to talk to these. A uh, good buddy of mine, Dave Rizzotto, worked in 1127, the, the Unix group at Bell Labs in Murray Hill. And I got to hang out there on various occasions. And, uh, you know, it's <clears throat> they were always, uh, uh, you know, they always liked the simplicity of the language. They always liked the directness of its interface, the predictability of the language. And they were always somewhat apologetic about uh, its... Uh, uh, it's fragility, I guess. So uh, I mean, nobody was shocked, but uh, and I think I think it took a lot of years. What was more interesting is I went around to all the companies. I went around to Sun and IBM and HP and all the companies whose Unix versions before Linux became dominant, and said, "Here's what's going on in your code." And and I presented I presented these talks to the to each of these companies. Uh, after we had the initial work. And what was really more interesting was the response because the group, the group and the audience divided into two, into two halves. You could just see them kind of shift. And, and in one half was going, how is this going to get me my next batch of code out the door? I don't care. <laughs> and the other half were saying, you found, the other half were saying, you found bugs in my baby. I've got to go mm. fix it. These were the craftspeople. And these are the people who were almost running back to the office before I could finish my talk because they wanted to fix the damn bugs. They wanted to download, download the bugs and fix them. And so there really is, there really are two different mindsets out there. One that just says, I got to get the next piece of functionality out the door. And if this slows me down, you know, and we know, and you guys all know this from security. The worst thing you can do to somebody with is give them a lot of vulnerability reports because then they have to face it and figure out what to do with them. If they don't see the reports, they can get on with their work and pretend everything's fine. Yeah, one area that we've seen a, a lot of software vulnerabilities today, I feel like a lot of major platforms have made a lot of headway, such as Microsoft and software security. But I feel like the embedded systems and the what we now call IoT is lagging way behind. Um, what are your thoughts, uh, Miro and Ambar, both on improving the quality of code that exists on these embedded systems? So, well, go ahead, uh, bro. I yeah, I I I think that you know once again we uh, we have to improve the quality of the code, uh, but we are getting into. <laughs> A, a life cycle where you get an update of any of these uh, apps or what have you almost weekly or daily and the assumption is I will ship you the functionality and uh, and I will fix it as we go. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we are trying to do just to bring the discussion a little bit back to the swamp is we are coming and saying uh, we will make it as easy and as flexible to do a continuous assurance, which is sort of a, a continuation, no pun intended, to continuous integration, and will help you, if you care, to get these things out uh, faster. I, I also think that one of the problems that we are facing is that we don't have tools out there that are telling you how bad your code is, in a, namely, I cannot analyze it. So if you want me to be able to analyze your software, you have to write something which uh, is, is manageable in terms of complexity. And Heartbleed is, is an example of what happens if you write code that uh, only two p people on this planet can understand what's going on there. I usually yeah. write code that only one person on the planet can understand, <laughs> and that's me. <laughs> I, I was just going to uh, about the you know this this continuous yeah. shipping thing. If you want to see heads explode, uh, talk about DevOps in front of a SCADA crowd. Yeah, <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I just, yeah. yeah, yeah the, the heads explode, and and it, but it does come back to, you know, how, let me do a, a little setup for you, uh, Maron and and Bart. If only there were an affordable easy to use way to test code quality and to test the tools we use for testing code quality to make sure that they don't miss things. That would be fantastic if we could like move software security forward by some sort of, I don't know, DHS inspired and uh, academia driven uh, project to uh, help us assess code reliably and repeatably. Wouldn't that be great? 
No, so, that's, that's the best. That's such, is that that's the best lo- setup you've ever gotten? That's, a, that's such yeah, a so idea. that's what. Uh, <laughs> we, we are we are working hard at this. The the still, I think the the obstacle that we have to to uh, you know cross or come over, which is uh, the the managers or the the people who are responsible for telling the the programmers what to do somehow have to encourage them or the clients have to demand that they know something about the quality of the software before they download it. And frankly, I don't know how to make this happen. That's a critical point. I mean, Microsoft's, um, Microsoft's reset, what was it, 13 years ago, 14 years ago now, was, was not uh, some sort of act of altruism and whatever on the part of, of Gates and company. It was, they were staring at uh, large corporations and governments saying, uh, we can't run your software anymore. It's crap, it's insecure, it's unstable. We can't do this. We're gonna stop giving you money. And that drove you know Microsoft to shift gears. Uh, so how do we, uh, driving demand is, is a challenge. Uh, well, yeah. you know, so, you know, you know two, two things. Two things. I mean, one is um, getting companies to face that point of view is is really difficult. It takes you know it takes some terrible exploit. Um, mm. Well, like at Target, you know, uh, get you know had this terrible attack. And I actually uh, shortly after uh, that, I was talking with the new CIO and the recent and the newly hired Target did not have a CISO up until that point. And I was actually talking to them about something totally different, saying, do you know when you buy a cell phone in your store, you're exposing all this personal information on the screen and you require the buyer of the cell phone to reveal information you should never have? And they didn't see any financial issue related to that problem. And they were not confronted with that problem in the media, so they weren't interested. So here's a company that just gone through a traumatic um, uh, situation where they had to kill their CIO. I don't know if they actually killed them or not, but they got rid of them and they replaced them. And I'm talking to the guy sitting in a still warm chair from his predecessor saying, do you guys know you have a PII problem here in your stores, the way you sell your cell phones? Because I had just bought cell phones, actually. Um, and uh, and they said, well, nobody it's it's not something in the public media yet. So we really don't need to address it. Oh. And, and so and, and so. You know, what more do you want? Now, the swamp itself, you know, when you, if you have software and, uh, and we love, you know, whether it's commercial or we love the open source community because that's where our roots are, uh, and you, and you want to go out and run it against the best right now static analysis tools, we have both commercial and open source tools, and just upload it and push a couple of buttons to get a report, that's what we've got right now. And if you're a tool writer, you know, if you're somebody trying to come up with the next great analysis tool and you've got a great idea um, we've got a lot of the software automation that makes it easy you don't have to you don't have to worry about competing with the big guys like Averti or Fortify we have built a lot of those frameworks uh, audit tools that you can just pick up as open source libraries and then just put your idea out there in the swamp and have people using it right away so so we're we've got this open door it's free uh, it's funded by our government. The government doesn't have any rights to the data. It's kind of nice. Marone, Marone dealt, dealt really nicely. At DHS funds us, but they can't see our assessment data. So you get to run your programs and keep stuff private until you feel like releasing it. So you can upload it easily. You can keep your data private. You can share it with your friends. You have free access to tools. You don't have to worry about configuring the tools or downloading them or keeping them up to date or figuring out all those crazy options on the tools. So we've got all that, we've got all that working. And now, and we have people coming and using it. It's great. We have classes using it. We have, there are faculty around the country who are running their classes through it. So there's some definitely good news and bright lights, um, but there's a lot of people who aren't. So, so Bar and Miron, so let me get this straight. You have a DHS funded project where anyone can upload their code. No one else sees the results, but whoever is uploading it and it helps make your software more resilient, right? Yes. Yeah, it, it, it helps you, uh, you know, it's still you have to do the work. We, using the tools, we are identifying potential weaknesses 
and uh, then it, it becomes your responsibility to 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 deal with them. One one of the advantages, as Bart pointed out, with sharing, you can show a potential customer or somebody who wants your software how you develop it over time and how you are dealing with uh, mm -hmm. weaknesses that are being uh, identified. You can basically show your software assurance hygiene so to, are the, to a potential user uh, or consumer. Are the issues that you're finding, are they strictly security related? Or are they more uh, performance related? Are they more uh, integrity um, or uptime? Like what types of they're, issues they're, are you pointing out? You know, we're running, you know, so we're not in the tool business. We're, we're, we're bringing together all the automation. So the tools we're bringing to bear are mostly ones that are, are correctness, uh, integrity, and security tools. So, you know, uh, you know, tools like, you know, uh, find bugs, clang static analyzer, CPP check, uh, error prone, uh, and, you know, and then, so these are all, these are, these are tools that, that you're familiar with some of them on the commercial world. We have tools from Parasoft and this cool company down in Australia, Red Lizard, that has this awesome C, C++ analyzer called Goana. So, and we're going to soon have some more commercial tools in there as well as, as soon as the lawyers get done beating beating each other up, or whatever, whatever, or, or different form of that ad, uh, that verb, um, and so, uh, so you have all these. So there, there are some. There, the tools are out there for 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 doing this, and we're and we're we're bringing them in, providing a uniform world. You can run them in, provide the automation for them. Um, you know, C, C plus plus, Java, Ruby, Python. Uh, and Android, we, and, and, we're and we Android. are also we are also open to host tools. So mm -hmm. if there is anyone out there that feels that his or her tool can benefit the community or wants to use it even privately, we can uh, accommodate them. We have developed a platform that is very flexible. At the same time, is uh, providing the needed protection that we can bring things in, we can run them isolated in virtual machines, so we don't have to worry if there are problems in the software that's coming in. And a, one of the things that we also offer is a viewer called the X that allows you to look at the different, you know, results from different tools in one uh, a coordinated display. That's another thing that is sort of driving the vision of the swarm that we believe that if you want to do it right, you have to use more than one tool, mm. which you understand that not everyone is excited about it. But we are creating an environment where you can bring results from different tools and then look at them under one uh, coordinated display. That's really awesome. So is cool. there, if I want to integrate this or recommend that people integrate this into their, into their uh, SDLC, are there API hooks that you can call or, or, or do I have to put libraries inside of my software or can I do either or both? Well, there's, there's, there's a couple of things that are, that, are go, that are going on. I mean, one is you can just go to the website and upload stuff. Um, the other is we're working on uh, basically uh, push button exports from your favorite IDEs. Mm -hmm. Um, and also uh, direct pulls from repositories. I got gotcha. you. So, so, so today we are already integrated with GitHub, mm -hmm. not only in terms of moving stuff, but also with identity management. So we accept uh, GitHub identities uh, in the swarm. And we, we also are working uh, and pretty advanced in having a portable version of a swarm for those who want, who like the concept <laughs> and for whatever reason want to create a, an instance of it locally, as uh, Bart pointed out, we are open source believers, and everything that we are doing is open source, including all the the backend engine that is doing the scheduling and the management of the continuous assurance, and we we have what we call at the moment the swamp in the box that uh, can be installed locally if that's what is required right you know if you have you know if you're uh, a gov if you're a company and you just can't, if we have a major healthcare company in madison called epic systems which has more yep. than half the u.s population online they're just it's, fantastic 
and the largest they, software for health uh, organizations, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And they and they and, and we work with their security team, and, and they're a really stellar group there. I'm, you know, we're we're we, you know we're you know we're 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 very happy to work with them, and but they really can't because of HIPAA and a variety of other things really give us their right. software. And so we want to give them a swap in the box. Uh, you, you talk about people who are across national boundaries. There's limitations on, on how they can move software. And you even talk to people in the government. You know, we like, you know, we have we have discussions for doing what we call a high side, a classified swamp. So people inside the government can run this. Um, you know, they can't ship their software outside because it's uh, proprietary or classified. So we want to give people a chance to run their own local version. So people, so people that don't have that need, you're really better just like, you know, if you if you can use the cloud, you're better off because Google or Microsoft or Amazon probably have better security people than most companies do. Mm, yeah, that's and, a point we've been coming back to a lot, Bart. Yep. And yeah, absolutely. And and so you know we're kind of like you can think of us as a cloud service for software assurance tools. And so if you if if you can get over the trepidations of letting something outside your door, um, you know, we're probably a pretty good place to do it. You know, everything we do is in isolated virtual machines. We have actually a pretty cool model, and, and Morel was pretty insistent on this, and I have to give him a lot of credit for it, that when we go to run an assessment, we take <clears throat> a, a non-running virtual machine and we populate it with a tool, we populate it with a software to be assessed, and whatever other data we need, and then we go ahead and run this virtual machine um, isolated, completely isolated from the rest of the swamp internal environment. It can reach out to servers and bring in software updates, but it can't reach out any internally and affect anything else in the swamp. Well, only when the assessment done and the virtual machine is quiesced and stopped, then we actually uh, extract out the assessment results. So we run stuff sort of in the maximum isolation environment just to keep, so we're, you know, we're trying to set the highest bar we can. For, uh, so are you collecting statistics from the software that's updated that are uh, anonymous statistics? So can you, could you produce or do you produce reports that say this is the most common bug that we're finding in all the code that's being uploaded? Uh, we, we, have, we have in our, in our archives all the, all the assessment results. And actually currently what we're working on is we're working on basically the data mining uh, tools, trying to get a lot of... We're, because part of what we have the data about what's out there and what we're and actually one of the things that uh, and I should let Marone <clears> speak to this. But one of the things Marone's very interested in is getting metrics about the software, trying to measure things about the complexity and structure mm. of the code. Mm. And what we'd really like to do is not just say what's frequent, but we're trying to come up, trying to. And this is work in progress, so we can't. I can't point this at. But this is work that we're currently looking at, of saying, you know, can we actually make statements about what as what what kind of weaknesses in the code uh, come from what kind of practices in programming? Mm. Yeah, so I, I believe, or we believe that just generating statistics that we saw that many CWEs uh, it may, may not be that useful uh, because I think it depends a lot of the, what software you have and what mm. is the mix and what is running. And, and you can have mm. one... Uh, <laughs> application we talked the other day with one uh, commercial developer with uh, I don't know several billions of lines of code and you bring them into the mix that can have a huge impact on the statistics I we feel that what is more important is to see whether we can identify how these uh, uh, vulnerabilities or weaknesses are being addressed by over time I mean do people, which one are being removed, uh, which one are being flagged as uh, non-existing, and what do people do with the information that we give them? And for this, we need to go beyond the, the, the line uh, number level of associating a, a defect or potential defect. And we are bringing now in tools that will allow us to a group the information at, at the file level or at the module level so that, you know, changes that come in from uh, software development uh, still allow us to keep information about the, the life cycle of the software. I hope it makes sense. I would make, 
making long statements. No, no. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, it, it's it's a tricky thing to to slice it up. I mean, it also what I would want from it too is to know the some of the uh, flaws in the software, like which ones take longer to fix. But obviously, that depends on a lot of environmental factors, not just the bug itself. I mean, one of one of our goals is to set this thing up, <clears throat> um, try to have a reasonable anonymizing interface, because one of you know we talk about supporting communities, and obviously, one of the communities we support are the software writers. The other obvious community is the tool writers. Um, we're also looking at uh, educators, so you've heard us talk about those. But um, another really important community, which we're, 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 we want to start bringing into play, are the people who study the, the software process, right? Who study the life cycle, who study the tool, who study the, the engineering aspects of this. And we want to give them, we actually want to give people the query ability to look at these things, look at characteristics of software without looking at the code, looking at, looking at the mm -hmm. summaries of the reports. And, and let people, you know, we're, you know, we're not big enough, even we're, we're a pretty big project, but we're not big enough to do all these things ourselves. And so we're so open interfaces are really important to us to bring in other people from the community who want to study these things. We want to get smart, you know, other smart graduates, smart graduate students and young faculty who want to understand this process better. So the, the people that are working on the project, are they full-time employees, graduate students, fellows? Like, how does it work? It's, um, go ahead. It, it's mainly full-time uh, employees. I, th I think the, the exception is Bart has at the, in, in his job. Let, let me make a sort of a, a brief description of how we are structured. Sure. So it, it's for uh, institutions where the lead is the Mortgage Institute for Research, uh, uh, which is on the UW campus, but is an independent nonprofit organization. And that is where we host uh, the, the swamp itself. And that is where the team that is actually implementing the, the infrastructure reside. But as the chief scientist is leading the, the tool part, and he's doing it as part of the University of Wisconsin Madison, and he has students that are working on the tools, but he still has three full-time employees that are really providing the the kind of quality and continuity that we need for such a project. Uh, the other two partners is is a group uh, that is led by Von Welch at the uh, Indiana University where they are responsible for the security. Vaughn is the security officer of the SWARM, and they are also responsible for operation, 24-7 support, and, and things like that. And then Jim Vasney at the, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, who is part of NCSA, is responsible for all the identity management aspect uh, for those of you in the area, he has been uh, responsible for my proxy and our CI logon. So we really, I think, pull together the, the best mind in all the different aspects that we felt are needed to create such a neutral, open, and dependable facility for the community. Excellent. Um, other Security Weekly cast and crew questions for our, our guests. I, I had one, but it, it, it got lost a long time ago. <laughs> I honestly don't remember. That so martini's I mean, going right to your head, huh? No, no. Jack brought this up already, and we touched on it. We said we don't have an answer yet. Where I'm curious is how, I mean, this is brilliant. I'm sitting here stunned and excited and thrilled going, well, then how do we encourage more of it? And I, I guess then there may not be an answer, but I think that's an area where collectively as a community, I'd like to see, I mean, if this exists and we can start to do this, and Paul, I loved your questions looking at the ability to, to figure out where to prioritize, right? Mm. What are the mistakes that are happening? What's the process to fix them? The, I mean, Jack, you were right. This is this is brilliant on a lot of levels, and, and Bart and Marone, wow, great. It, it, but this is, we uh, have to we yeah. have to get more people in business saying, 
yeah, did you guys check it with that yet? Did you run it through that yet? Did you, did you figure that out yet? And that's the part that where my brain is spinning. I wish I had answers, but I'm I'm still at the I'm trying to formulate the question stage. Well, so, you know, we're we're spending a lot of time. I mean, evangelism is an important part of our job, and and this is something that really surprised me. <clears throat> um, you know, going actually going out there and uh, going talking to meetings, appearing on panels going to soft engineering meetings where they have nothing to do with security and somehow tell them, yes, security is part of your superior part is part of your thinking. <laughs> um, uh, and you know, I talked to a bunch, I talked to a room full of testing managers and they were trying to figure out, well, why is this relevant to us? And I'm just going, Oh, okay. Well, this is interesting. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of doing that and actually, <clears throat> you know, advocating even at the government level, Maron and I have been, to met with U.S. senators, we met uh, with the state, of, our state assembly, trying to trying to make this uh, realize, make people realize that there's some real issues here that um, that can't be ignored. So, I mean, and you know, doing things like this, like your this uh, this 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 broadcast you do, this podcast you do, you know, getting more people to see these things and pay attention to it. So we we can use uh, all the help that you can give us. To bring what we offer to 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 the broader community, or any guidance that you can give us on uh, tools, approach, things to do. I, I'll give you just a small example of again came up in a discussion that we had with a vendor the other day. They said, "Okay, great idea. We would love to bring in another tool, but here's the problem." We, have, we are using one commercial tool, and we already flagged all the stuff that we, uh, is false positive. If I'm bringing now a new tool, it will reflag all of this, mm. and I don't have the resources to unflag it. So here's an opportunity for somebody to come and say, how do I work across tools? And again, as, as, as we mentioned earlier, this is against the grain of, of the ecosystem there, which is trying to lock you in. We, we talked with, with another very large uh, organization that has a lot of apps that they are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And they also brought up the fact that they are cons that they, they worried, uh, they have been working with one uh, tool provider, but they feel that they are being locked in. And one of the things that we are trying to do, and we need, you know, your help and anyone else you can bring to the table on this, is to make everyone realize that we have to, to work across. And having an open platform like the one that we are developing can play a role in allowing a sharing of results, sharing of, of, uh, of tools moving across, which, yes, is risky to, for some of the vendors, but I think we all know that no single vendor can do it all. Mm. Let, let, me throw, let me throw out one of my <clears throat> current, uh, current soapboxes. And, uh, you know, there, you're, you're not allowed to publish results from running these tools. So, you, so nobody... Interesting. Even in, no, it, it, it's just like you can't publish results... Actually, this started out as something called the DeWitt Clause. One of our, <clears throat> one of our now uh, emeritus faculty, when he was a young assistant professor, measured a bunch of database systems. He's a very, very well-known database guy. Did a lot of stuff in benchmarking. Very, you know, he, that was one of his claims to fame. And he measured a bunch of database systems back in the early '80s, and it included uh, Oracle. And Oracle looked really bad in that in that paper, and he published it in the top top technical conference. Um, and Larry Ellison immediately called up our department chair and said, fire this bastard. Um, and <laughs> that, which was just a very typical, Larry Ellison is known for his social graces. Um, and he, we didn't fire, well, I wasn't there, you know, I was, had yet been, I was just a brand new guy at the time. The department did not fire him. Um, and, but let, they went on to put this clause in their, in their software that says, you cannot publish anything about performance or correctness results from our software. And if most software you look mm -hmm. at, you cannot tell about what's going on in it. Uh, and when you're looking at these software scanning tools, 
whose job it is to create security, to create assurance, to really deal with national and global security issues. I mean, this is serious stuff. You cannot publish a side-by-side -side study of these things saying this tool is better at this than that. So there's no way for you to go out in a consumer report sort of way and know which tool to buy. Huh. <clears throat> so we have some real we have some really interesting legal challenges because nobody wants to go up and fight this battle against these companies. And it's not clear whether these clauses would really stand in the long term if they were if they were challenged legally. But it's a pretty intimidating thing to try to fight that battle. Mm. So well, is that a plus? Or, I'm sorry, Paul. I, but I just, I mean, I. That's kind of both, right? That's a, it's, it. Just is. That's not necessarily good or bad. I mean, in some cases it's good, in some cases it's bad. But it, the good news is it, it keeps you out of the politics of it, right? Well, you know, I would, you know, when I, you know, I did fuzz testing. What I was going into is the consumer reports business, and this, and and what I told the students who were working on this was said, look, we're going to get a lot of visibility on it. I mean, even before we had the first, even when we, when we got the very first results, I knew this was going to have long legs. I didn't quite picture it kind of lasting this long, but <laughs> I knew it was going to, I, I knew it was going to have long legs. And I said, what we have to do is we have to make sure our methodology, we convince ourselves that we have an unbiased, fair methodology. We have to make sure that our tools, our results, and our, everything that we do is out there for download. So, there's absolutely nothing that appears in any of our reports that you can't get the raw data, you can't get the tools and reproduce yourself. So transparency was absolutely essential for that to be. And, and this is and the people in the consumer reports business really understand this because they're they're always going up and saying, you know, your blender sucks, your car is your car is wonderful, your car is a disaster. I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff. Um, and so I'm not afraid of doing that. Um, because, because uh, I, because, because we'll approach it mm -hmm. from a completely open, transparent form. So I, I mean, we published. We actually did a study. We compared Coverity and Fortify. Back, we had we had this funny window of time. We had license agreements that let us do this before the companies really caught on. And we did this about <laughs> seven, seven or eight years ago. And I had done. We had done this in-depth study of the Condor system, Marone's software. At the time it was, you know, about a, we looked at about a half million lines of code. We had precisely identified vulnerability reports, not 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 weaknesses, not putative vulnerabilities, but ones that we could actually build exploits for. So we had a handful of like almost twenty vulnerabilities that we had found um, <laughs> in their code, and we so we had this completely calibrated real-world data set. Um, and ground truth, you know, in the security world is really hard to come by. So we had, we, and, you know, we didn't have all the things, but we had, and we ran Coverity and Fortify against these, these, these uh, packages because that's what was the best of the day then. And, you know, Coverity found one of them, Fortify found three, and the other most, the other almost 20, neither tool found. Mm -hmm. And so we were, and we're, and then we went to a big discussion about that, and there was a huge false positive rates, and that's, you know, if you want to get one of these companies freaked out and you and you say, well, I'm going to publish something about your tools, talk about publishing false positive rates because they go, <laughs> they go, they go, they go. No. I mean, I can develop a perfect software assessment tool. I guarantee I can write a tool that will print out every line in your code that has a vulnerability. I guarantee it because I'll just print out every line in your code. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to have a few false positives, I'm sure. Right, but, right. But it's okay. So, but we did the study and people looked at it. It was really, it was really, I think it was informative, but I can't write a paper like that again. Mm. And I would be happy to do such a study. I'd be happy to help researchers use the swamp to do such a study. Um, uh, I know DHS would love, would be happy to see that happen. Um, you know, our NIST, the National Institute of Standards Technology runs an, a competition on this kind of stuff. But they don't, they can't publish the results. So um, have we have we have some questions uh, from Aaron and Bart that we will publish the results. Uh, we're going to ask them live on the air. Uh, Miron, I'm going to start with you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh Two. my! <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, Miron, three words to describe yourself. Uh, I I hate uh, waste. And I uh, believe in in leveraging. Bart, 
in, intense, uh, uh, happy, and uh, crazed. Bar, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? What would be my weapon of choice? Probably the propeller of my Cessna. <laughs> their own? Uh, <laughs> Um, bad, bad software. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good, good answer. answer. Good answer. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant answer. Miron, if you were to write a book about yourself, what would the title be? I told you. <laughs> Bart? Uh, I have no idea how this is going to end. Bart, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? <laughs> I think that means yeah, first. That, that just <laughs> happened. Hey, I, I guess I, I guess I don't quite know how to answer that one. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a popular game in Europe. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time there, and, and I haven't had my S grab except to have my picket uh, by pocket try to be picked. But uh, uh, I, I guess I guess I like to, I guess I like to experiment. All right, Miron. First yeah, or second? I, I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I don't know. You know, again, uh, uh, not, not sure what uh, I, you know, if, it, if it's a game, I don't care. You know, it, 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 I, I enjoy the game. I, uh, I, I think for you, Miron, uh, zero is probably the right answer, right? That's the observer. <laughs> you want to see what happens first. <laughs> <laughs> Miron, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh gosh! Yeah, this is the hard question. Yeah, and you got asked it first. I know. Uh, alive, or alive or dead? Alive or dead does not matter. Okay. Fictional or otherwise? Yeah, I, 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 I must, I must admit that I am a pretty. Um, uh, how should I say it? I'm not a celebrity person. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I'm. I, I feel very fortunate that with the the parents that I had. That's so, that's a good answer. And, and that's yeah, a good, so that's that, a good so answer. to me that would make your parents celebrities in your own mind. That's right. That's a good okay, answer. Good. <laughs> Bart, to, over to you. Choose th two celebrities to be your parents. Well, I I certainly can't complain about my own parents. They're 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 pretty amazing. But if I was going to pick somebody famous, I'd pick Mark Twain and Madame Curie. Oh, very ooh, nice. Wow. Very nice. Oh, nice. Excellent. The website ooh, ooh. is continuousassurance.org. Bar and Miron, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thank you, guys. Uh, this was a fun. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, Thanks, thank guys. you. Thank you. And don't forget that uh, we need your help to accomplish what I believe all of us uh, have in common. Absolutely. I, I, I think I'll be adding a... Uh, a swamp promo slide to most of the decks that I deliver I agree. for uh, the foreseeable Jack. future. I encourage just, others. You know, pop same. one in right there before the how to how to email me or something, just yep. to to plug it going forward, especially at the developer uh, events I do. I agree. Yeah, With that, right. we're going to take a short break. Come back and talk about our stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 